Hello and welcome to FSPA's Continuing Education Programs. This class and course is ATM 101. It's uh, ATM basic training uh, for beginners and a little bit of uh, knowledge for experienced uh, people in the ATM field. Uh, my name is Fred Wheeler. Um, I'll be doing the presenting today. Um, I have 30 years of experience in the ATM business and many of you uh, FSPA members do know me. Um, I am uh, on the board of directors of FSPA, so thank you for uh, participating in our continuing education, and uh, away we go. Okay, this course, again, just a quick overview on the class. Um, we're going to talk about ATMs historically and some of the current technology today um, to provide you with a better understanding um, for administrative staff, um, for service people, for training. Um, all new employees and, and sales, of course. So we're going to look at you know what is the purpose of an ATM, the purpose, the manufacturer's type. Um, how does it function? So we get an overview about the hardware. How does software work? How does software work in general? Um, and as it relates to the ATM, how do ATMs communicate? A little bit of historical communication information and communications from today. And how does the transaction work? What happens when a consumer walks up to an ATM and puts their card in the ATM? What is the transaction flow? You know, what's a brief overview of how that works? Uh, a little bit about advanced functionality. Um, advanced function, no envelope deposits, uh, remote teller, um, and uh, the teller cash recycler, of course. Um, again, new technology, some new technology, new terms. Um, and again, a lot of the new things that are uh, facing us in the uh, ATM world today. Uh, the purpose of an ATM. ATMs can basically be divided almost um, in half, and there are two separate businesses completely. Uh, the first is the retail or ISO market. Um, ISO independent service operators, which are people that deploy ATMs in convenience stores uh, and, and consumer centers, uh, grocery stores, supermarkets, things of that nature. Um, they're there for one reason and one reason only, to generate revenue um, for the owners. That revenue is in the form of two different um, incomes. Uh, one is the surcharge, which is a dollar to five dollars. Um, generally, they run about two dollars and fifty cents, is the standard surcharge today. Um, and captive audiences like Disney, um, again, they'll be paying as much as $5. And honestly, in casinos, they actually do it on a percentage. They charge their charges on a percentage, which is really expensive. Um, but again, people will pay the fee. Um, a lot of people, as a matter of fact, can, uh, refer to that as a fee. Um, interchange. Interchange is what MasterCard and Visa pay um, the ATM owner or the, the transaction deliverer um, in the form of about 75 cents to $1.50 it was, the interchange. Uh, today it's running about 45 cents. This varies greatly um, from network to network and transaction type, but they're running on average today about 45 cents. This is going to be reduced. And recently, uh, MasterCard Visa have already announced that they will be reducing interchange as soon as EMV is enacted. The other side of the story is the financial financial ATMs, bank-owned, financial institution-owned ATMs. Um, they're there for convenience, for customer service, for 24-hour service, uh, for consumers, for members of, of credit unions and customers of banks. Um, they're there to save labor costs and, again, um, just enhance consumer service uh, for those financial institutions. Very few, if any, of these devices actually make money. They generally are a cost for the financial institution. The U.S. market, the U.S. ATM market hasn't varied much um, in the last few years. Um, there's about 433,000 ATMs operating today inside the United States. Um, interestingly enough, less than half are owned by financial institutions. About 48% are owned by financial institutions and are those financial ATMs. Uh, the other 50% 2% are all those retail and ISO machines. Manufacturers. Just like the, the business, the manufacturers can be split um, pretty much. So, you know, the first we look at is those retail, those simple machines, those 
um, two to five thousand dollar ATMs you see everywhere. Um, that industry was was led for the longest time by Triton, um, and just in the last few years, Mullis Yosun has come to the market, and now they are the number one by far uh, provider of retail ATMs. Um, there are a few others: Tranix, Tantal, Jamega, um, GRG in China. Um, that have entered into the market, but pretty much a lot of that market share is Donald Ciosa and Trite. On the financial side, it's the big two. A majority of the market has the big two, the NCRs and the Beebles. Um, I have Tidell on the screen. NCR did purchase a company called Tidell, which was a retail uh, machine. Um, that didn't work too well, um, so Tidell went away. NCR is still attempting to do something on retail. But the costs still remain high. Um, Diebold um, actually just announced recently um, the acquisition of Wincor Nixdor, a uh, German based ATM company, and the new company is going to be called Diebold Nixdor. Uh, now, Siosong, again, is the next player in the market, um, pretty big globally, um, growing rapidly here in the United States. Uh, Wincor Nixdor, if we just refer to German based. Um, Wincourt next door again just was acquired by Devol, so that limits these players a little bit more. Uh, GRG, which is a, a China-based um, ATM, and Fujitsu, who was um, in the United States pretty strongly, but now has left the U.S. market completely, uh, but still uh, functions um, internationally. <coughs> Excuse me, ATM types. So ATM types we refer to, and again, um, just training salesmen. If you take a, a, an account rep um, who is an experienced with uh, ATMs um, and send them out in the field um, to talk to a customer about ATMs, if they gather just two pieces of information um, and, and give that to somebody with some knowledge, no matter what make or model of machine you happen to market, it's all the same. Um, you have to look at the functionality, what the machine can do and the installation, where it's going to be. So again, as far as functionality goes, you look at cash dispensers, it just dispense cash. Uh, full function machine is what they're referred to. They basically are envelope deposit machines. Advanced function, a lot of times referred to no envelope deposit. Then of course you have the remote teller, which is kind of new technology. The other half of the puzzle is the installation. Where do we want that to function? Do we want it standing alone in a lot? You want to go on through the wall so somebody can walk up to it through the wall and the only thing you see is the face of the machine. You want to drive up type machine and, and again drive up machines are another through the wall type of ATM. And of course the island machine and still standalone bunkers. Um, again, those two pieces of information um, handed to someone that has some ATM knowledge and the makes and models that you sell today, they can pretty much recommend the device for that. Um, particular customer in a particular location. ATM function, we're going to talk hardware a little bit. And again, this is really brief um, overview of the ATM hardware and how it works and what it, what it does. Um, hardware can be broken down again into the, the process of the core, which is computer, uh, customer interface. How does the customer inter interact with that machine? Um, card reader, again, it has to, every ATM has to have a device that will read and interpret card data. Uh, a bill dispenser, a receipt printer, um, an audit recorder, in other words, some type of journal. It used to be paper, then that's not in existence anymore. And again, um, your depositories that, that take in envelopes or envelope list deposits. So let's talk about computers in general. Computers in general are just a PC and peripherals. Um, the box that you have on your desk at home and have had for the last five years is a PC. It's a personal computer. Uh, peripherals are all the devices that plug into that central box, the central floor. So again, we look at those peripherals. You've got a user interface. In other words, um, uh, visual capabilities like a screen that, that a, a user can see what the uh, data and information the PC is presenting to them. Um, a keyboard for, for input. Um, for, for again, consumer input. Um, again, other things are printers, and scanners, and they're all hooked to a, to a network. Um, generally, it's called the internet. Um, 
again, and that's how your PC at home works. An HDM is nothing more than a very heavy, sometimes over 2,000 pounds or one ton or better, PC and peripherals. Just like that um, device that you've used at home for years, it has a core, it has a process, um, it has a user, user interface, it has a peripherals in, in the form of a build dispenser, a card reader, a receiver, and again, it goes off to a network. <laughs> Excuse me. Your PC or process, let's start there with the core, it's the brain of the machine. Again, it has a motherboard, it has the memory, uh, RAM memory, random, which is random access memory, and a hard drive, some type of long-term storage. Random access memory is very volatile. Um, as a matter of fact, that's how a PC works. What it does is it takes some data from the permanent memory, most of the time a hard drive, loads it up to, into RAM, and then that's what you work off of when you're running in, in a, a computer, um, an ATM. Um, when you reset a machine, you reboot um, or restart, all you're doing basically is clearing the RAM out and starting over again with a fresh load of information from the hard drive. Uh, communications interfaces, again, most is uh, TCP IP today. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, Least line and dial-up. Um, you have media drives, a CD, floppy drive, um, or a DVD drive. Um, and again, a lot of ATMs aren't even including that anymore. They're just including USB ports. And then peripheral driver interface ports. In other words, um, a, a circuit board inside the PC that acts as the interface to all those peripherals, those build sensors, those receive points. So let's talk about media handling. Um, again, the first thing in ATM, there isn't an ATM out there that doesn't have to build a sensor. It's a requirement. Um, there are two types. Um, there's a presenter and a spray. A presenter build dispenser, basically that's exactly what it does. What it does is stacks all the currency, all the notes in the one stack and presents them all at once to the consumer. A spray dispenser, you'll see a lot of the, uh, the lower end machines where it just counts the, uh, the currency into a bucket, basically, or a tray um, that the, the consumer picks up when it's done dispensing. Um, spray is a lot cheaper than uh, the presenter type building sensor. We just see those in a lot of lower end, more economical uh, retail type ATMs. Um, they all contain one to four cassettes with an average about 2,000 notes. I mean, a little bit lower in retail, a little bit, retail, a little bit higher in financial, but around 2,000 notes. Uh, what that building sensor does, it actually counts the notes. It has no idea what the denomination is. It doesn't know. 20, a 10, a 5, or a 1, it just looks at that note, that piece of paper, actually cloth, those are made of cloth, and, and it, counts it. it counts it twice. It checks it for, for size, checks it for thickness, by the way, it's 0.06 millimeters, it's the width of a bill, or a note, um, diverts the bad notes into a divert then. In other words, if one of those multiple checks has any question, the bill dispenser will keep those notes. It'll divert them and hold them and make another attempt to deliver to that customer. A bill dispenser and most dispens bill dispensers actually make three attempts before they give up and tell the customer can't deliver the currency to them. Um, if all the checks are correct, it delivers the note to the consumer. Um, the other thing is, again, the next piece is a receipt, um, a transaction record. Um, receipt printers um, do print, again, receipts for the customer. 99.9% uh, .9 of them today are thermal. They work on thermal paper, which means no ink cartridges and all the old items that we needed to run um, printers in the past. Most of them are 40 columns, some are 80 columns. Most uh, thermal printers are single-sided today. Um, there are some dual-sided um, thermal receipt printers out there on the market today. NCR, in fact, has one. Um, user interface. <coughs> Excuse me. User interface, this display unit. Um, historically, it was a CRT, a cathode ray tube. Um, tubes are gone, the factories are closed. You don't see CRTs anywhere. 
um, today, but again, they started out with CRT. Today they're LCD, liquid crystal displays, and most are backlit LCDs. As a matter of fact, most of the screens you see today are back, backlit liquid crystal displays. What do I mean by backlit? Um, they have LEDs, light emitting diodes in the back of them that brighten the screen. Um, every laptop computer has a backlit LED for a screen. As a matter of fact, if you unplug the power and go to battery on a laptop, your laptop pretty much turns off the backlight, the LED. So that's how you can see an example of how that works. Customer input. So again, the device has to take input from people, from consumers. And the way it does that, today a lot of devices have gone to touch screen. In other words, you touch the screen and there's actually a matrix over the screen that identifies where um, someone has touched it, where, where that matrix, is, matrix has been broken. Um, function keys, again, those are going away, but there's still some machines that have those little blue buttons um, on either side, usually four on either side. They're function keys or FTKs. Um, EPP, which is an encrypted pin pad. Okay, every ATM has an EPP to that. Okay, it's required um, by uh, by PCI compliance. Magnetic uh, stripe reader and our magnetic card reader. Um, again, there's multiple types. There's the fully motorized, full insert, which historically people have used, um, and, and the ATM started with. Then we migrated to dip and swipe. A majority of ATMs today are dip type card readers. Um, currently, there's a big migration to EMV. Uh, EMV stands for Europe MasterCard Visa. It is the global standard for chip technology. And who makes it? MasterCard and Visa. Um, so that's why it's called EMV chip technology. Uh, chip technology is much more secure than the old stripes. And one of the things that's interesting is when a chip card is used, the card has to stay with the device for the entire transaction, which means consumers in the United States, like in Canada and the rest of the world, had to get used to not just putting their card in and pulling it out of the machine on a dip or, or just swiping their card. They're going to have to put the card in the device and leave it there for the entire transaction. It's a, a large part of converting to EMV and a large challenge for any environment that's converted to EMV is just getting consumers used to doing that. Uh, depositories. Depositories, you have your envelope depository units or EDUs. Um, again, it's a way to take deposits. Historically, that's the way it has been done, um, where consumers put cash and checks in the envelopes, they put them in the machine, um, and then it has to be validated um, long term uh, by, by the machine itself. Uh, I'm sorry, by a teller. Um, envelope list deposit is much, much, much better functionality. What it does is it accepts notes and, and checks and makes images of the, the check um, so that you don't have to go pick them up every day. You don't have to um, settle those envelopes. You can um, provide immediate validation for them and immediate access to cash. Um, it's a lot more secure for cash where it actually validates the notes and checks them to see if they're fraudulent. Um, so the next next step, again, next piece to talk about would be software. Um, just an overview on software. Again, software, like everything else we present in this training class, is a lot more intricate and a lot more detail to it than we cover here, but due to the basis. Um, again, ATMs, software-wise, um, ran on their own software, basically. Every manufacturer wrote their own specific application for the machine. Um, and then the industry standard became OS2, IBM OS2, um, until IBM announced the end of life for OS2. So OS2 has gone not just from the ATM, but the market in general. Um, at that point, um, all the ATMs migrated to Windows, Windows XP, uh, currently migrating to Windows 7, and, I, and of course with the smaller machines, Windows CD, and we'll cover a little, that a little bit more in depth in just a second. Excuse me. Software overview, again, um, with those little machines, 
um, very little capacity, cost is, a, is an issue. So again, you want to have the simplest form of transaction processing. Um, they run on Windows CE. What is Windows CE? It is basically Windows stripped down of a majority of its functionality. It is the basic form of Windows um, that you, that's available today. Um, Full-blown Windows, again, right now we're migrating from XP to Windows 7. Um, most devices should be on Windows 7 today. If not, they will be soon. One of the requirements to move to Windows 7 are uh, is the PCI requirement for um, updated security patches periodically. Well, the old Windows XP software is not supported by Microsoft anymore, which means no more security patches which means that any APM that's operating Windows XP um, is in violation of PCI because they cannot get security patches. So again, Windows 7 is the standard. Um, Windows 10 will be the next leap, and that will be right around 2020. <coughs> Excuse me. Software. Again, software is in layers, um, reads like a book. Um, one layer works off another, so you have to, again, put it in layers, because that's how the PC works. Um, so we're going to look at these multiple layers. First thing we look at it, again, in the machine is a motherboard, and any PC is a motherboard, just like an ATM is. Um, the first thing that happens when you push the power button on a PC or on an ATM is it looks at a thing called BIOS, Basic Instruction Operating System, which tells the machine to do these basic things look and see what's out there, look and see at the memory, the RAM memory, is that out there, how much do I have of it? Um, is there a hard drive out there? Just the basic stuff, okay? And then it runs, again, test all that, or the post, power on self test. Um, years ago, when computers first started, you could actually see it do that, you could see it counting the RAM and testing the RAM. Today it goes by so quickly, you can't tell that it's happening, okay? And what happens at the end of, of the BIOS or in the post is it tells, again, the machine to look in a specific place for the next set of instructions. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that is the hard drive. Okay, So it goes to the hard drive, and that's where um, the operating system is and most of the software is. Um, again, the operating system is the foundation of the software. It is the base. Um, again, Windows 7 for big machines, Windows CE for smaller machines. Um, you can run a big machine, you know, one of the financial machines on Windows CE, but you have the capacity there. Why not take advantage of the functionality of full-blown Windows 7? Um, the next piece is, is bridge or middleware. Um, what happened when OS 2 uh, went away is all the ATM manufacturers went to Microsoft and said, hey, we want to use Windows. We need bridge software. Can you write bridge software for us, for MCR, for DBOL, for everybody else? And Microsoft said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. They wrote a thing called XFX, which is the bridge software for financial systems. XFS is for financial systems. So it's Windows for financial systems. Um, every manufacturer uses it. And this is, by the way, one way that multi-vendor software works. So the XFS layer is all the same for everybody. So again, they can use, put their application on top of that, and use NCR's application in a default or default application of an NCR or WinCore or EOS. Um, so that's the middleware. Application software, that's the next. And again, you know, you think of Word and Excel. Um, video games, those are all applications. Okay. Um, no, Hyosung, um, again, for retail use, use it too. Um, for Hyosa, for financial, um, it's called MP2S. Um, one thing just to, um, to, to fill in here and to inform everybody else is that all of the software for every manufacturer is only based on two different parts of software. It's called NCR NBC and Debold 912. Um, if you're not an NCR or Debold, what you do is what they call emulate an NCR or Debold. Fujitsu's emulated and looked like a Debold. 
the ozones emulate and look like an NCR. Um, so again, with them going on to NCR, their applications, they actually have two applications, um, advanced NDC, which again is the old um, industry standard state screens format um, of application. Um, Edge is a little more open environment um, and a lot easier and a lot more is kept by the ACM and that is taken out of the control of the network and legal is called Agilus. Post download is the next step. Again, so we've now loaded up the application. The application is called the machine. Okay, what what do you do with the instructions you get? How do you uh, how do you work all these devices, these peripherals? Um, the whole host download does everything else. Um, all the transaction data comes from the host or the network, like a Pfizer or an Alarm or a Vantage, um, any one of those guys. Again, they send the download and they control the machine. Um, Dev keys and receipt info are all in the lot in the load. Um, just for reference, uh, a lot of people say that you know a machine um, loses its dev keys, it actually doesn't. Um, what happens is data encryption standard um, is the uh, the form of encryption that is used for the PIN number that people insert into an ATM. Um, what has to happen is there's a unique set of keys um, that are put into the ATM and on the host end that have to match. And every time there's a transaction, they have to change in the same sequence. Well, if one gets out of sync from the other, it looks like it's not working and people say it lost its dead keys. They actually didn't lose them. Um, they just got out of sync. So what you're doing is you're telling the machine to go back to those starter, those keys that are input by a human. Those are the starter keys that actually align with what the network has. Um, again, in the receipt info. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, agents. In today's world, it's all about agents and apps. Um, apps on smartphones. Everybody's heard of them. If you haven't, that's what they call every little button on a on an iPhone um, or a smart device. It's an app. It's an app. An application link. Um, in the ATM world, a lot of times they're called agents. You put an agent on the ATM. To run deposit automation and do uh, connect to a consolidation server, you put agents on there to do things like diagnostics and web conferences. So again, agents and apps are, are pretty much the same. Um, they're just basic a basic link to an offsite application to put functionality into that device. Um, client server relationships. Again, um, a lot of people ask, are you the server? Are you the client? Um, the server is in control and controls everything. Normally, that's the network. The client is the device, like a smartphone, like a PC, like an ATM, um, like a tablet. Uh, cloud. Again, the, the big mysterious cloud that IT companies have been talking about um, for the years. Basically, it's all just multi redundant, huge servers. Uh, Google, I believe, has 32 of them in the United States today. Apple has multiple. Um, of these cloud servers, and they're just big buildings with, with storage and operational um, computers in them, giant servers. Um, so that's all the cloud is. It's, it's a lot more secure than a PC uh, because it is multi-redundant, so you'll never lose your information. Um, I don't know if you've looked, and you, you know your smartphone, as long as you have connectivity or your tablet to the internet, it never goes down, like your, your host computer. Why? Because if one of these cloud servers goes down, there's always another one to step in its place. So they're multi-redundant. Um, how do they communicate? How do ATMs communicate? How do PCs communicate? Again, you know, they communicate in multiple fashions um, to a server of some sort. Um, some of the uh, the existing some some ATMs still communicate via least line. Um, some dial up, and again, the latest communication method is TCP/IP. Um, dial up again is the old voice standard. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of retail machines, just because of cost um, and the cost to change or upgrade them, still run on a dial up um, environment. Um, it's very slow and very unreliable. That's why uh, sometimes you go to a retail machine in a location that seems like forever. To complete the transaction, that's because it's run dialogue. 
um, leased line or dedicated lines are very, very expensive. Um, they can cost as much as $400 a month um, to go out to an ATM. Um, again, very limited, no open network, um, but they are very, very reliable. And that was the industry standard for ATMs for the longest time. Uh, TCPIP. What is TCPIP? Um, it's a language of the protocol. Protocol means language. Um, Transmission control protocol slash internet protocol. In other words, the ATMs and most everything today use this protocol, this language that was developed for the internet. Um, again, it, it can be initiated by either the, the, the host of the ATM, um, can use some existing infrastructure. Um, it's more um, technology driven and electronics driven than it is physical driven. Um, and it's very cost effective. Um, just a standard TCP IP network, if you've ever seen the, uh, you know, all the numbers and the dots and, the, and what does it all mean? Again, it's, it's a very um, technology driven, software driven type of communication that you can run multiple communications, uh, multiple different devices or to a device running multiple different items on it. By using TCP IP, and it's a very, very simple um, IP network um, with, again, two branches, and just kind of how the addressing goes and how it works. Um, in the top, it's all in binary, ones and zeros, how computers work, it's all about ones and zeros. And then down on the bottom, uh, black piece is what it's converted into uh, it's a numeric. Uh, just some common terms. I'm not going to go through all these, not going to read all of those. Um, one of the things you should know about, um, for a secure website, most websites you'll see the HTTP in front of their www, the World Wide Web. Um, the S stands for secure. If it doesn't have an S, it's not a secure website. It's not a secure, uh, uh, not, not, doesn't have secure access. Sorry. Um, again, a lot of things, FTP, um, uh, SMTP is, is, talks about uh, email. And again, I'm not going to go into this uh, too much, but again, just, just some common terms um, to reference. Wireless. Wireless is cellular. Um, it is very, very strong technology today. Honestly, wireless is actually faster and has more capacity and most wired solutions um, that are available today in the United States and then in global. Um, great replacement for dial-up. It's very cost effective. Um, again, when you are installing an ATM there, you have to get a good signal and understand it is wireless. So if your wireless carrier um, is Verizon and you have a Verizon cell phone, it's very easy to do a site survey. Just look down and see many, how, how many bars are on your phone. Um, if you have a very weak signal on your cell phone, that means your ATM is going to have a very weak signal. So uh, again, wireless um, TCP IP is the way to go to that. <coughs> ATM transactions. How does an ATM transaction work? What happens when a consumer walks up to an ATM, puts their card in the machine, and decides they want some cash or they want to make a deposit or a transfer or something? Very, very basic again, um, this is what we're covering on this. Um, first thing that's determined whether it's a foreign transaction or an on us transaction, we see that a lot of times. An on us transaction is a transaction that is completed by the financial institution that if the financial institution that issues the card and holds their account owns the ATM, it's an on us transaction. Everything else is a foreign transaction. Okay, so if you use an ATM in Florida and your bank is in Washington, you'll be doing a foreign transaction and be charged a surcharge for that transaction. Or what they call today a convenience fee. So uh, again, we'll look at just the typical transaction path, how it works. So how does this happen? You know, if a customer, a consumer walks up to an ATM, um, puts their card in, first thing it asks for is their PIN number. Um, again, their PIN is encrypted three times, triple DES. That's what triple DES means, that the PIN is encrypted once at the PIN pad. It's decrypted and then re-encrypted before it leaves the machine, and that's done at the PC level. Um, 
good thing we're at, at selects what type of transaction is balanced right here, the withdrawal. Um, whatever type of transaction they want to do. Um, one thing to completely understand, it's not until that point that the ATM actually communicates with the host. What it does is it bundles all that information and sends it out to the host or to the network. Okay? Um, card info, everything to the network. Okay? Um, again, the network receives that request. Routes it on us or foreign. Um, how does it know how to do that? By the bank identification number or VIN. You probably heard VIN. You probably heard VIN blocking. If you haven't, that's what it is. It's actually the first four numbers on every single card that's out there. So if you want to know what VIN your card or anybody's card is using, it's the first four numbers. Okay. Um, again, whenever you get ATM, there's a way to have the honest. Or, or surcharge free transaction or the transactions that are going to be charged that $2.50 surcharge, that $1 to $5 on average. And the way they do that is we do a thing called thin blocking. In other words, you just tell that network or that device, that ATM, that you want these specific thin numbers to not be surcharged. Um, a little backwards. But it's easier to put in the three, four, or five, and most financial institutions have three, four, or five bins um, into the machine than it is to put in the thousands of others um, to tell the surcharge. So again, bin blocking means you're actually telling that device, that ATM, to not place a surcharge on um, these specific cards, these specific transactions. Excuse me, transaction complete. Again, um, the network gets all this information, goes and checks the uh, consumer's bank account. Yep, they add the $20 in the bank account. Sends back to the ATM a message that includes everything. What notes to deliver. In other words, deliver one $20 bill for a $20 transaction at a cassette number one. Um, print data. What's the print on the receipt? what to put in the audit, the electronic journal, or EJ. Um, user interface instructions. It tells the ATM what to display. And then the ATM will deliver that, will complete that transaction, um, and report back to the network that says, OK, transaction complete, or I had a problem. I couldn't give them the cash. I couldn't print receipts without a paper. Um, and that's the end of the transaction set. Okay. And this is just a, an image, believe it or not, often a, a data scope of an actual live transaction um, at an ATM. And I'm not going to lie, this is a few years ago, but this is an actual withdrawal transaction and what it looks like. The communications out to the host, um, back to the ATM, and then on the bottom, um, the ATM telling, believe, believe it or not, this one is telling it the uh, it's low on receipts. That's the second line from the bottom, that 107 at the end. Um, that's the actual error that it's sending back to the network saying it's low on receipts. All right, let's get into advanced technology a little bit. We're going to talk about um, some advanced technology, including deposit automation, um, automated teller, and a few other things. <coughs> Excuse me. Deposit automation. Again, this is that no envelope deposit that's out there. Today, it's becoming more standard than anything else. Um, actually, well adopted. It's been out there for about seven years. Um, any financial institution that's still doing envelope, capturing envelopes, um, is making a big mistake because it's still it's a customer inconvenience, a consumer inconvenience, and it's not cost effective at all. So deposit automation is the way to go um, for, for taking deposits, if you're going to take deposits at the ATM today. A um, couple things to look out for with this is, is um, a requirement is, um, again, with the network on that side of the communication, um, two-button deposits, what they call a two-button load. In other words, it separates the cash deposits from the check deposits. What does that do? It makes the availability of the financial institution to immediately credit 
the cash that's been validated at the machine into a consumer's account. A lot of consumers look for that. They put cash in the machine to do a balance of to make sure it's there. Um, if you don't have a two button, button load, if you do what they call envelope emulation, all that has to wait till the next day uh, or until it's cleared. Okay. The other part is the checks. Again, the checks normally, um, normal banking rules are the first 200 they allow on a check. Um, and then the rest when it's cleared. So again, cash and check separate. Um, there is a whole separate functionality which is driven by one of those agents we talked about earlier, which is called consolidation. What it does is it works on check 21. In other words, it takes the image of the check that's deposited in the machine and puts it in a format to be sent to the Fed to be cleared in the Federal Reserve. Most people run checks this way today. Um, there are a couple ways I've seen people with machines do a thing called sneaker net. In other words, they'll put in a deposit automation machine that takes checks and takes cash, and Susie Teller in her sneakers goes out to the machine, gets the checks, and her sneakers goes back to the branch and runs them to their branch capture. Commonly referred to as sneaker net, believe it or not. Um, envelope emulation, again, where all the deposits, they may be going in there separate as cash and check, but they're all combined together and it looks like, um, and again, handled as one transaction, it might as well be all checked. Um, again, the last piece is you have to take those images. When, when you take an image of a check, the check is not the instrument anymore. In other words, those checks are no good, so you don't have to worry about going getting the physical checks. Um, they're converted into an image, which is in an XML file format. Um, it's made available to the financial institution to validate. In other words, to look and say, yes, this check is good. Um, they send it to a thing called a consolidation server, which converts it into a form for the Fed, and the form is in a standard format called X.937. So the Federal Reserve, again, gets all those check images and then sorts them all in the middle of the night. A remote teller. Remote teller is something that's new over the last few years. Um, NCR um, broke ground on that market pretty much, um, and again um, worked into it because they uh, they purchased the company that did remote teller, um, and then started to integrate it into the NCR machine. Um, that's the after active teller. That's their machine. So if we go from left to right on here, um, Eagle has a thing called an ILT an inline teller. Um, what that is, it's just the teller replacement, just to do self-service and just for the teller line. Okay. So it does self-service transactions in a teller line for the teller replacement. Um, the AIT, after interactive teller, the NCR version, again, today, all of these are being developed, so there's new functionality changing all the time, so whenever you look to this, this may change, but Today, after interactive teller is basically a teller extension. In other words, it allows for video conferencing and remote control by a human long distance to the machine. Um, but again, it requires just that that teller still has to perform that transaction um, with that human. There is no self service built into it. The Yosun, um, which is the last one here, is the assisted self service device. Again, what it does is it does self-service first. Um, it puts out an expanded set of self-service transactions. And then, if assistance is needed, it has the video assistance and the remote control available. Uh, more along the lines of the self-checkout model in, uh, you see in supermarkets um, and Home Depot and big box stores where um, basically every four one out of every four transactions requires assistance. Um, so again, it's self-service first. Um, and again, the teller only gets involved about 25% of the time, 20 to 25% of the time. Uh, TCRs, teller cash recyclers. Um, these devices are made to provide the financial institution with technology, um, again, to do personal service, 
stop the tellers from counting cash, counting cash, and doing deposits. It has a lot of extended security features. Um, it makes life a lot easier for the branch and the teller. There are a lot of operational cost savings with them. Um, the main key when you're talking about teller cash recyclers is connectivity. Um, make sure, again, the one what's on the screen is the Geosun, but if it's Geosun or Glory, um, an NCR, that connectivity is the key to making them function. Because the connectivity between the teller's core system and the box doesn't work, the TCR will not work. Okay. Required technology. A lot of this new technology requires a lot of technology in the background to run it. The more functionality we put into ATMs and, and um, what we consider financial self-service devices, the more you need in the background. You're still going to need transaction process. If you're going to take deposits, you need a deposit server. If you're going to do marketing on the machine, you need a marketing server. Um, again, if you're going to interface it with web and mobile, you're going to need a server for that. You need a constant server for the video, remote control, remote diagnostics, and again, patch management to make sure the software is up to date and up to PCI requirements. So there's an awful lot of technology um, that's required to get the most functionality out of those boxes out there, whether it's a D-Bold, NCR, WinCore, Yosun box. Um, some of the things you run into, some of the challenges you run into in the new technology. Uh, most financial institutions have very, very high security standards for their communications, um, internal in their branches and out to their devices and their ATMs. Um, getting through those firewalls um, is a challenge, not just initially, but ongoing. If someone in the IT department of a financial institution makes a change in the firewall, it could affect everything else that you're doing and cause problems. So understand that challenge um, with network security. Uh, bandwidth, again, huge requirement there. When you start adding technology in, most financial institutions, their communication out to their devices and out to their branches um, are very, very small, what we consider pipes. Um, a lot of them run DSL, which is tiny. If you look at the chart on the right, I mean, that's what you're looking at. And what I referred to earlier with wireless IP, um, it's probably one of the best values that's out there. Wireless IP, you can run four gig of bandwidth. Um, for about one to two hundred dollars a month, a good value for the communication better go on with these landlines. All these, the DSL, the T1, and the T3 are all physical landlines, and you notice the T3 um, runs you between three and twelve thousand dollars a month. Um, not very economical um, when you're talking about putting in NBRs and uh, video conferencing. Um, again, one of the hidden costs is. You need to pipe the run up. <laughs> Excuse me. New technology, again, some of the new challenges. Some people that are putting in new devices, um, you know, the ILTs and uh, the NCRAITs and the OSINs are looking at, at skipping a piece in the puzzle. Uh, normally with the ATM, the ATMs run on a thing a lot of commonly referred to as an ATM rail. It is an interface to the core um, and to the networks. Um, that is specifically not designed for self-service machines for ATMs. Um, a lot of these manufacturers are looking to skip that and go direct core integration. Um, that requires an awful lot of work to honestly almost reinvent the wheel when you're talking about an ATM integration. Um, the last integration, which is, you know, again, there's labor involved, but it's inexpensive, um, is a human integration. That's the way AIT works. Um, the interactive teller actually has a screen that the teller remotely controls and remotely does a transaction with the consumer. And they actually go in and check and do the integration into the core system. So, again, three options that are out there. Um, all have some benefits. Um, all have some, some, some faults. But, again, that, that's what's out there, the core integration, HCAM integration, and human integration. New technology, again, for the financial institution, um, a lot of them pull their hair out. They don't understand. They don't understand, and they, they're challenged with all the IT integration. Um, you know, they have a hard time understanding how this is going to work for them, how does it benefit them. Um, there's a lot of challenge. Most manufacturers 
we'll come in and introduce new technology like an AIT or even a Yosung or a Hebel, and they won't mention the cost to the financial institution of their own people doing the integration into their own IT system. And, and what the backbone and all the investment they're going to have to make in their own technology to make it all work. So again, when you're out talking to people about advanced technology and deposit automation and consolidation servers and interactive tellers, understand that the manufacturers aren't going to tell you the cost to the financial institution of doing this integration. They're just going to say, oh, by the way, this is a requirement. And it's, it's pretty big for them. The FI, so just understand that. Um, new terms, just recent terms. Um, one of the newest ones that's out there is FinTech, financial technology, and financial technology companies. Um, cloud based software, a little bit older, but it's out there. Um, again, it's starting to become more prevalent in the financial industry. Um, and omni channel, single channel integrated solution. Um, just understand what they are and then what they mean. You know, cloud is just a massive service. Um, instead of being on site, they're kept off site, multi redundant, and omni channel. And again, it's tying all the different channels, the HDMs, the web, the mobile, um, all into one single functionality. Uh, mobile, well, let's talk mobile just real quick. Um, again, I call it forget. My marketing people shoot me for this, but I call it forget. So again, what you want to do if you're, if you're going to be in the consumer service business today, you need to get mobile. In other words, you need to have a website that's mobile friendly. And yes, that, that gets crossed up a lot. People look at the web banking, internet banking, and mobile banking, all as different features. But believe it or not, they're all the same, the foundation of the website. Um, just put it into a, a mobile environment. Um, get social, get noticed. That's social media, that's Facebook, that's uh, um, you know, Pinterest, um, all those social media, LinkedIn. Um, again, to get noticed, you have to be out there. So that's where you use the social. SEO, search engine optimization, gets you first. In other words, there are companies out there and, 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 and ways to make sure that your financial institution or your product or your service, when somebody does a search for pizza on the internet, your pizza place comes up first. So search engine optimization helps get you on that first page. If you're not on the first page for something that you sell, um, when somebody does a web search, you might as well be dead because very few people go past the first page. So SEO is important. Um, so you got to get first. And last but not least is get found. It's uh, kind of a new functionality um, that Google has introduced where you do a thing called geolocating, where, again, you can put a, a, uh, a pin on a map of the financial institution branch um, and ATMs, and it'll actually come up and give directions and where it is. And so people can look on a map and say they're looking for an ATM, type in ATM, a little red dot come up, they push a button and it gives them directions how to get there and who owns it and what it is. Um, just some functionality on this bottom line. Again, you're talking about mobile banking, internet banking, mobile banking, again, starts with a website just in a mobile format. Deposit automation, taking a picture of a check. Um, marketing, um, again, marketing for mobile. And again, video conferencing, which is something that, that's new technology out there. Believe it or not, a lot of doctors and hospitals are starting to use this technology where you can actually have a web conference with your doctor instead of going to see them. Um, NFC, we'll have to, we have to talk about near field communication, which again is how um, all this pay by phone works, Apple Pay, mobile wallet. Um, it is a very short range communication between a smartphone and a transaction delivery device. Um, that's why it's called NFC. Um, it's out there, still struggling with the security on it. Um, a little bit, believe it or not, there isn't even a standard for it, so um, it'll be coming in. Apple Pay is pushing really, really hard. I know a lot of financial institutions are signing up with Apple Pay, um, but just understand there's some security challenges there. And right now in the uh, labs, people are, including us, developing uh, NFC for uh, 
again, doing a transaction on your smartphone, walking up the ATM and getting your cash or completing the transaction. Omni-channel, again, single source solution um, for every channel that the financial institution wants to do. So if you're looking at consumer service, again, it's all tied together, all single channel, um, same touch and feel, interactivity, interconnectivity. Um, so again, that's what omni-channel means. Um, again, technology over the last few years, the way it's been, believe it or not, on the left is an AT&T 6300. I used to own one. Um, I was shocked when I got up to 2 meg of RAM. I thought it was the end of the world and I'd never need any more. Um, RAM dial up out to the internet. Again, very slow. Again, that's where we were, believe it or not, not very long ago. Uh, the next um, step in technology, this technology, was getting the PCs and servers and, and running routers. Um, more capacity, a bigger fight, a little bit more functionality. And today, um, the entire world is migrating to cloud computing, cloud-based computing, uh, wireless communication um, for all our technology for, for, for smartphones. Um, you know, if, if people don't know this, the reason why a smartphone can do what it does is because of central server cloud computing. In other words, the application the software isn't on the machine or isn't a hard drive. It's all in a central server and it communicates via wireless communication. That's how a smartphone works. Okay, and that's almost tablet um, that, And that's what's enabled us to get PCs so small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. Um, financial technology. Financial technology has been slow, to say the least. Um, again, the first ATMs weren't even connected. As a matter of fact, the balances were kept on track three of the cards. Um, so that card with the bank stripe data on it, there's three tracks of information on it. The first ATM has actually kept the balance on one of those tracks. So they weren't even connected. They were standalone. Um, and it would just change the balance on that card as needed. Um, current technology, again, you're looking at routers and dial-up. Um, most financial institutions, that's where they are today. Um, FIs know this. Um, and if they don't know this, you're going to know really quickly they need to migrate to a cloud-based solution um, for their consumer transaction folders, for their mobile sites, for their ATMs. Um, if they're going to truly achieve an omni-channel solution, the only way to do it is with the cloud, and the only way to allow consumers with the flexibility that they need today is through wireless communication. Um, so again, omni-channel, we look at the formula, look at many different um, industries, it's self-service first. Self-service first for consumers. Convenience is right with self-service, so convenient self-service. And then mobile integration. You have to integrate what you're doing with mobile. So if you look at places like Walmart, Walmart, um, if nobody knows, if you don't know this now, Walmart has stopped building big stores just like most retailers. Um, they're building things called Walmart neighborhood markets. They're going to build a ton of them. They're going to be more convenient. They're going to be in the neighborhood. Um, they're rolling out more and more self-service checkout, use self-service. And they're integrating more and more into mobile technology. Um, actually testing right now, you go into a Walmart, and if you have your shopping list, it'll actually tell you where all your, uh, the items you're looking for and what's on sale. So if you're looking for orange juice, it's going to tell you where the orange juice is and what type of orange juice is on sale or has a coupon for it. Um, medical. Again, with medical, um, the medical industry, you don't go to hospitals anymore, you don't go to emergency rooms anymore, um, you go to urgent care. Um, you go do self-service, like uh, my doctor said, hey, listen, you know, you should monitor your blood pressure, go to CVS or Walmart or one of those stores and sit down in the kiosk and check the blood pressure. Um, don't come in here and do it. Um, you want information? Go to our website. So again, same type, self-service first, convenience, mobile integration. Financial institutions have to do the same thing. Self-service first, convenient, smaller locations, 
and mobile. The future of banking, again, everybody has been asking it, the questions out there, the future of banking. Again, we have opinion of a lot of people in the industry, and honestly, my opinion is, let top work like everybody else does. Like technology, deliver the transaction, invest in people to deliver high rate customer service. That's the formula that works, that's the formula that works in every industry, and that's the formula that will work for financial institutions that have um, where they're trying it. <laughs> Last slide, shameless plug. Um, my name is Fred Wheeler. I am the Chief Operating Officer and uh, of uh, Automated Transaction Delivery, a new FiTech company, financial technology company um, that actually develops and delivers this for financial institutions. And we use a direct and a partner channel. So if you're interested in uh, providing this technology for your customers um, and to help grow your business, please let us know. And the very end slide is that if there's any questions, again, don't hesitate to reach out to um, us, uh, BJ Hansen at FSPA, and of course the FSPA website, fspa1.com. Um, or you can reach me, Fred Wheeler, at uh, Fred at ATMWorldwide.com and ATM, ATDSolutions.com. So at this point, um, this is our presentation today. Thanks again for spending the time and taking the time to uh, attend um, this uh, FSPA continuing education program. Thank you.